tried to organize the material somewhat differently. First of all, how many people heard me at TASI this year? Okay, so there will be some overlap. And I'll use the opportunity to talk about supersymmetric theories to tell you some general lessons about quantum field theory in general that perhaps you did not learn in your one or two semester introduction to quantum field theory. Quantum field theory is a very complicated, rich subject. You have already seen some glimpse of it in Witten's talks the other day. But this is just the beginning of a rich subject, which for some reason the literature does not do justice to. If you look at the literature on quantum field theory, and I'm sure you have seen that in your quantum field theory courses, you're in, in part one of your quantum field introduction to quantum field theory, you do a lot of Fourier transforms and you have creation and annihilation operators and you try to keep track of all the factors of two pi and that's just the free theory. And when you come to loops, the nightmare gets worse because there are divergences which you subtract. It's not clear why you subtract the divergences. And when you go to two loops, they're overlapping divergences that I don't know anybody who admits they understand how to do it. And it goes worse and worse. And by that time, many people are totally confused. What is quantum field theory all about? So what I'll try to do in these lectures give you another way which does not replace the honest computations but try to give you a way of organizing some of this material in a way that is more physical. Now, a lot of these basic conceptual things are not mine. They were completely understood long before I went to graduate school. So just set the record that this is really ancient times, but for some reason, most of the literature on the subject does not explain properly. I don't know why it is so, but that's a fact. Okay, so this is kind of a general philosophical introduction. So our goal in these talks is to understand the dynamics of quantum field theory. This will be important in some of the other talks that you will hear here, ranging from the more phenomenological introduction to the standard model, or the supersymmetric standard model, which Nima will start today, through what Witten, the chapter that Witten did not describe about the dynamics of n equals two, going through applications in string theory and so forth. So we'll start very easy. We'll do it with n equals one. And we'll have in mind a situation where we have some quantum field theory at short distance. And we try to describe the long distance behavior. And the, ba the way to do that is to write things in terms of a supersymmetric effective Lagrangian. So the main idea is to do as much as we can with effective Lagrangian, because effective Lagrangians this is a notion that goes back primarily to Weinberg, but also to Wilson. Effective Lagrangian is a very useful way of organizing all the information that we have very easily. For, in particular, they allow us to organize the symmetries, impose all the symmetries. Weinberg has these talks where he describes how he understood how the pion Lagrangian captures all the information in all the commutation relations of current algebra and what a big day in his life it was when he realized that. The second thing is that it makes very clear is the notion of locality. Quantum field theory is local, and when we write an effective Lagrangian, we expand in the number of derivatives, and we write an effective description of the theory as an integral over all of space-time, and then various terms with increasing number of derivatives. So if we want to do it in, with supersymmetry, we should write things in terms of an expression in superspace. So the Lagrangian that we will start with is an integral d4 theta. There is some k, some Kähle potential, which is a function of the chiral superfields and their complex conjugates. There is an integral d2 theta of a superpotential, which is a function of the chiral superfields. And then there is a complex conjugate. So this is the Lagrangian. Whoops, sorry. This is the Lagrangian, but that's not the whole story. We have to add the Lagrangian an infinite number of high derivative terms. And we will see in the talk, not today, maybe only tomorrow, that these terms can be crucial 
And if you do not include these terms, you can even get the wrong answer for processes with very low momentum. So again, I emphasize, we normally instructed to expand in the number of derivatives and keep only the leading order terms. And this is almost always true, but it's not always true. And we'll see examples next time where this is not true. So anyway, this is our description of the long distance physics. Now, just to calibrate myself, how many of you know what I mean by K? Okay, good. Because I think this was not explained by any lecturer here. Is that right, John? Did, did you explain K? No. But everybody knows, so it is as if you did. They probably don't understand it as well as they would have if you explained it to them. But. Now, the key thing in mo all of the talks I'll be talking here, and in fact, in most of the recent developments in supersymmetric theories, come from a very simple observation. That this W, the superpotential, is a holomorphic function in the superfield phi. So these phi's are chiral superfields, and W is a holomorphic function of them, locally holomorphic. To be precise, or more concretely, W is independent of phi bar. It's a function, locally a function only of the phi's. And that comes in the literature under various different terms. One term is chirality, is a chiral superfield, so W itself is a chiral superfield. The second place, which you have already heard both in Bagger's talk and in Witten's talk, is through the notion of BPS. BPS states, or BPS functions, are objects which are annihilated by half of the super, supersymmetry transformations. They are supersymmetry. In a, in a trivial way under some of the supersymmetry charges, they're supersymmetric in a non-trivial way under the other half. This notion of BPS was very important in Witten's talk and in Bagger's talk by making representations smaller. And we have a lot of control over small representations. In fact, the only thing we know how to compute are objects which are controlled by holomorphy or by BPS. And that has a number of other synonymous terms in the literature. So when you're given a supersymmetric theory and you're asked, what can we calculate? Well, in perturbation theory, we can calculate quite a lot. But if you are more ambitious and you want to make some exact statements to understand the theory better, then there's a very simple guideline. If it's BPS, we know how to do it. If it's not BPS, forget it. It's hopeless. Now, this is too strong, and I'm sure when the next revolution in physics comes in place, we'll know how to compute exactly things which are not BPS. But most of the excitement of the last quarter of a century goes back to this fact that BPS things are computable. And then we try to expand around that and learn physics, and I'll do some of that in today. So today you will see the first example how such BPS slash holomorphic slash chiral things are computable. Now, since I'm going to use the symmetries in a very crucial way, I would like to keep track of terms which break a symmetry. How do we do that? Well, the first example where you learned to, to do that was in, when you studied quantum mechanics and you tried to study a, the hydrogen atom and it has a huge symmetry group. And then you consider the hydrogen atom, say, in the background electric field. This is called the Stark effect. Or you can put the magnet, the the hydrogen atom in a magnetic field and the level split. And then you learn about perturbation theory. The electric field and the magnetic field can change the levels. They can also induce transitions between the levels. And a very powerful way to control it is to assume that the electric field is small and understand when we expand in it and to, extend, to understand how it breaks. It explicitly breaks some of the symmetries of the problem. And the term that comes there is the term of selection rules. There are some transitions which are allowed at first order. There are some transitions which are not allowed at first order, so they occur at higher orders. So we'll do the same thing here. And we are going to promote all, uh, all coupling constants. Promote all coupling constants.
to background fields. So that's what we do with, in the Stark effect. We have an electric field. The electric field is in a triplet of the SO3 of rotation, and that allows us to keep track of the SO3 symmetry even though it's explicitly broken. So we'll do the same thing here. We'll think of all the coupling constants in the Lagrangian as being background classical fields. They are not going to fluctuate. In the quantum theory, we're not going to quantize them. This is only a bookkeeping device. But the next thing we'll want to do is to impose supersymmetry. So it's not enough to promote them to being background fields. We'll also promote them to become background superfield. So every parameter you see in the Lagrangian, every coupling constant, should be thought of as a background field. What does it mean? It means that if we want to consider the theory for some value of the mass, or for some value of the Yukawa coupling, for a moment we think a much more difficult problem. The mass is not just constant, but we let the mass have some dependence on x. Different points in space-time, the mass is different. But since we're doing supersymmetry, the mass is not just a function of space, it's also a function of superspace. So we can let the mass have some x dependence, but also allow the mass to have some theta dependence. So wherever you see a parameter, think of it as a background superfield. In the end of the computation, we'll restore the fact that it's independent of theta and it's independent of x, but for the purpose of the discussion now, we'll pretend that it has a much bigger dependence, dependence on all sorts of couplings. So in order to make it a little bit less abstract, let's consider an example. So we'll take the killer potential to be the simplest one. So it's a theory of a single chiral superfield. The killer potential is this, and the superpotential is m phi square plus lambda phi cube. This is the simplest non-trivial supersymmetric field theory, and it's known as the Wesumino model. What are the symmetries of the problem? This problem has, has two U1 symmetries. So first of all, there's supersymmetry. But in addition, since we have one chiral superfield phi, we can pretend, or well, we can consider two symmetries. Both of these U1 symmetries are explicitly broken by the parameters in the Lagrangian. So the first symmetry we have is a global U1 symmetry under which phi has charge 1. We can rotate by phi by a phase. Both this term and this term explicitly break the symmetry. But in order to keep track of the symmetry, we'll assign U1 transformation laws to m and lambda. So m carries charge minus 2, and lambda carries charge minus 3. Recall the Stark effect. The Stark effect breaks the O3 symmetry of rotation of the hydrogen atom, but it breaks it by a vector. So if the matrix element you compute has the quantum numbers of a high index tensor, then it cannot be generated in first order perturbation theory in the electric field. This is what Mr. Stark did. The same thing is true here. The symmetry is broken, but if the correlation function you study has some charge under the U1 symmetry, doesn't mean that it's zero, but that tells us how many factors of m and lambda, what's the minimum number of m and lambda that is needed. The problem also has another symmetry, and you've heard a lot about our symmetries by the various speakers here. And I like to assign our charge zero to phi. That's not important. I can pick any basis between these two and consider another U1 R symmetry, which is a linear combination of this one and any number times the other one. Now, recall that the superpotential must have R charge 2. This is the normalization I like to use, and that's actually the simplest normalization to use. Now, this term is not invariant, because phi is neutral under the R symmetry. The superpotential should have R charge 2, and therefore M should have R charge 2. 
What about lambda? Again, phi has R charge zero. The whole thing should have R charge two. So lambda has R charge two. And again, notice, M and lambda carry charges. What that means is that they explicitly break the symmetry. But thinking of the charges will allow us to do very easily the bookkeeping of the symmetries. We'll pretend they carry charge, and then we'll just make sure that everything is invariant. So now comes the power of this method, because we want to integrate out stuff. So we're thinking of the quantum theory, and in the quantum theory, phi fluctuates, there's complicated dynamics, and there are very complicated loop diagrams to compute, and maybe even non-perturbative effects, which cannot be considered in perturbation theory. And we have to go to five loops and six loops and seven loops, and they are overlapping divergences and so forth. And it's all very complicated. But whatever happens, by the time we are done with the computation, we should be able to summarize all our answers by a supersymmetric effective Lagrangian. There is a hidden assumption here, which people are sometimes confused by. The hidden assumption is that the theory can be regularized in a supersymmetric fashion. So let's assume that the quantum theory really makes sense, supersymmetry is a good symmetry. If it's a good symmetry of the problem, it should be a good symmetry of the answer. What does it mean that it's a good symmetry of the answer? That if we start with this Lagrangian that I started up there, at some scale, I can integrate out modes and go to lower scales. What will the lowest effective Lagrangian, what will the effective Lagrangian at lower energies look like? It will look very much like the same, the first one. It might have a different K, it might have a different W, and it might have different high dimension operators, terms with more derivatives. But it doesn't matter, it should preserve the form. So let's continue to expand in the number of derivatives. And we are going to find some very complicated k, which is a k effective, which is a function of phi and phi bar, and now m and m bar and lambda and lambda bar, and so forth. So this object will be extremely complicated. But it's computable, and we can compute it at one loop, at two loops, etc. Much more interesting is the superpotential. So there will be some effective superpotential. And let's see what can we tell about it. Well, the first thing we know, it should be holomorphic. So it should have phi, but it should not have any phi bar. But in addition to that, it will have some dependence on the masses and the Yukawa coupling lambda. So here is the first time we see the simplification of due to supersymmetry. We said that m and lambda are parameters which we promoted to be chiral superfields. How do we know they are chiral and not any vector superfield or any other superfield that uh, Bagger explained to you, like linear superfields or others? Well, they appear in the superpotential. So the only way that this thing would make sense is that if m and lambda are promoted to be chiral superfields. So in terms of y, and there are some functions of y and theta, but they cannot have any theta bar in them. What does it mean for the effective superpotential? The effective superpotential can depend on m and on lambda. And here there's no bar. But there cannot be any m bar dependence, and there cannot be any lambda bar dependence. So the effective superpotential should be holomorphic not only in the fields, that's kind of trivial, but it should also be holomorphic in all the coupling constants. This is a powerful result, because without doing any computation, we know that something is holomorphic. And you've learned in your college years that holomorphic functions are functions we can control. We have a lot of control over holomorphic functions. Let's see how it works here. So we have some function of three variables we need to determine. Well, we need to impose some symmetries. And the symmetries are neatly organized in this table. So phi has charge one. Let's impose first the first symmetry. 
So it's a U1 symmetry. The superpotential should be invariant. And therefore, it must be some function, still to be determined, which depends on invariant objects. And there are only two invariant objects we can consider. So see the reduction in this, or the simplicity in the problem. We started a priori with a function of six variables. By holomorphy, we killed three of them. So we were left with a function of three variables, phi, m, and lambda. Now we impose the U1 symmetry, and we are down to a function of two variables. We still need to determine the function, but function of two variables is easier than a function of six variables. But we can do more than that. Under the R symmetry, this object, this combination has R charge 2, and this object has R charge 2. The whole thing should have R charge 2. So therefore, the superpotential must be of the form m phi square times some function, another function, lambda phi over m. So what have we imposed so far? We imposed holomorphy, the first u1, and the second u1. And by doing that, we have managed to reduce a problem of, which is some function of six variables, to a function of one variable. So this is enormous simplification. But we can do more. We can do more because holomorphic functions, as I said, are enormously controlled. In particular, imagine m is small, but not zero, and lambda is infinitesimal. In this case, perturbation theory can be used. What happens when lambda equals zero? When lambda equals zero, the superpotential is independent of lambda. This is a constant. So what happens at the next order in lambda? There is a term of order lambda. So let's write all the terms. So we for lambda equals zero, this is the answer. And if there are no, since there are no interactions in our problem, the coefficient here, which is a priori a number, must be one. Because it must be what it is when we started. Because for lambda equals zero, the theory is free. So the leading order term is that. What about the term linear in lambda? The form of the term comes from expanding this with that. So we are going to get lambda phi cube. And there's still a coefficient to determine. But since we work for infinitesimal lambda, the coefficient must be the same as here, as in the tree-level answer. So the coefficient is 1. But now we are out of luck, and we have an infinite number of terms. m phi square, lambda phi over m to the n, a n. Here, our symmetries are no longer helpful, because we've used all the symmetries. Every single term in this expansion is invariant under the symmetries. And we need to compute the coefficient. And it looks like we really need to work hard in order to compute the coefficient. So far, we've imposed supersymmetry and the two U1 symmetries. But now, let's put a little more physics into it. Consider a term here with n. This term has n lambdas, and phi has power n plus 2. How can we get such a term in terms of diagrams? In terms of diagrams, it must be this. So here, for example, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this is the n equals 5 term. When we go to higher orders, we just stick in more, more external links. That's good. This diagram is non-zero. We can compute it. And it can contribute to a n. Other additional diagrams with the same order in lambda. We can try and have loops. So imagine we add another line here. This line does not add phi's. The number of external phi's is the same, but it adds two more lambdas. This is incompatible with our general form. 
since it's incompatible in, with our general form, whatever this diagram gives us, the one with the additional line here, cannot contribute to the superpotential. So these terms arise from n order, in perturbation theory, three diagrams, three graphs. Only three graphs can renormalize the superpotential. But in fact, we don't need to worry about that. And these terms should all be dropped. The reason is, the reason can be explained several different ways. First of all, what do we mean by an effective Lagrangian? What we mean by an effective Lagrangian can be two different things. In this case, they are closely related. One is, you do the Legendre transform the way you were taught. You edge sources, you perform the Legendre transform, and then you construct the 1PI effective action. The 1PI effective action, this is, I'm sure you learned that in your quantum field theory course, does not include contribution from such three diagrams. This is not 1PI. This is one particle reducible, so we can just cut this line and reduce the diagram to two diagrams. Such terms are not present in the 1PI effective action. Another way of saying it is the following. Imagine we think of this as a Wilsonian Lagrangian. We started at some scale with the theory over there, and we integrate out stuff, go down to extremely low energy. What is the energy of the external legs in this low, very low energy process? It must be very small. This is the meaning of a Wilsonian effective Lagrangian. All the external legs have very small momentum. What is the momentum of all the, infinite, of all the intermediate legs? It should also be very small. This is in this diagram. However, in the Wilsonian effective action, what we are instructed to do is to integrate out modes and keep some quantum mechanics to still be active. In other words, we start from a quantum mechanical action at short distance, the fields still fluctuate, and then we construct a Wilsonian effective action at much lower energies, but it's still a quantum field theory. It's not a classical field theory. We still need to think of the fields in the Lagrangian as quantum fluctuating fields. The dynamics at low energies is what gives this diagram. So this diagram should not be included in the effective Lagrangian. Whenever you have a Wilsonian computation, you integrate out some stuff, you have an effective Lagrangian, but you're not done, you still need to compute amplitudes, you have to take this Lagrangian and still do some quantum mechanical computations. So it's not enough, so finding the Wilsonian action is step one in a two-step process. And this separation of scales is very common in physics. Born-Oppenheimer approximation, I think, is the first time it was done. Uh, where you have such separation of scales, you integrate out the fast modes, and then you integrate out the lighter modes, but this is very common and you will see it in many places. Well, the same thing is true here. Such contributions do exist, but they should not be included in the effective Lagrangian. They are included in the amplitude, not in the effective Lagrangian. The effective Lagrangian is a device to compute the amplitudes. It's not a replacement to doing the last step. So either way, we conclude that this term is not present, and the full superpotential is the same as the original one we started with. This result is known as the non-renormalization theorem. The superpotential, just one second, is not renormalized by quantum loops. In fact, in this theory, it's not even renormalized non-perturbatively. The result you see in the, the presentation you see in the literature for that, for example, in John's book, is not this one. You will see another presentation, which is perfectly correct. In fact, the proof in the literature, in John's book, or every, every, everywhere else, is essentially the same as what I've done here, except that I've organized it in a more conceptual way. The proof in the literature assumed that there are Ds and D bars and propagators, and you move the Ds around, all these manipulations are nothing but keeping track of the various U1 symmetries and supersymmetry. That's what it is. Yes, there was a question here. Uh, 
that's, so that's the third way of saying it. So way number one is the Wilsonian action. We still need to do the dynamics at low energies, and therefore we shouldn't include it. Number two, if you view it as a 1PI action, effective action, you still need to do classical physics with a 1PI effective action. And that's classical physics, and therefore it's not included. And finally, we can say, let's assume that the mass goes to zero. When the mass is very small, these terms become more and more singular. And therefore, it should not be included. All these arguments, superficially, they look different. But fundamentally, they are exactly the same. What do they tell us? They tell us that in the effective action, we should not consider, that we should not consider infrared divergent contributions to effective action. Things which are dominated by the infrared are computed later. So all these computations, whenever you have quantum field theory, you organize the computation in two steps. Step number one, you integrate out high momentum modes to go down to low energies. Step number two, you, you take the effective Lagrangian and you do the last integration. For example, another example from another branch of, it's the same branch of physics, roughly speaking, when people compute, say, meson mixing, neutral meson mixings, there is a part of the computation where you compute the operator that contributes to the transition, and then there is the next part of the computation where you compute the matrix element of that operator. So this separation of organizing it in terms of some low energy physics, and then step number two is done later, is very common. Are there any? More questions? So now it's time for me to ask questions. And this is your homework. Take this problem. I did here the simplest West Zumino model. Imagine you have several different fields. So this is exercise number one. Repeat this computation. When there are several different fields, phi, so m is in general a matrix with two indices, and lambda has three indices telling us how they couple to each other. And this is just, you just add the contributions. Prove that the same thing is true. This result is true even if you have several different fields. That's exercise number one. And exercise number two is even more ambitious. Imagine the theory is not renormalizable. That's a point that should really be emphasized when I talk to students. Quantum field theory doesn't have to be renormalizable. In some textbooks, people emphasize the renormalizability of the theory. A renormalizable quantum field theory is a theory which is independent of short distance details. The theory of nature does not have to be like that. We can have non-renormalizable quantum field theories which are certainly worth exploring. Example, Fermi's theory of the weak interactions. Example number two, the pion Lagrangian. They are not renormalizable field theories. They are extremely good, give us very accurate predictions, and they should be studied. So we are interested in general in a non-renormalizable quantum field theory. And in this context, we can put any k we want, any function of phi and phi bar, and put any holomorphic superpotential. So exercise number two, repeat this analysis or derive the same result for any k and for any w. I did it here for w, which is, has only phi square and phi cube, but you should be able to do it for any w and for any k. And the result will be the same. The result will be that the superpotential, in theories with only chiral superfields, is given exactly by the tree-level answer. The tree answer that we started with is the exact answer. Exercise number three, I expanded here in perturbation theory in lambda. This is the question with the star for extra credit. What about non-perturbative effects? Can there be effects which are non-perturbative in lambda, which cannot be written in the power series in lambda, like e to the minus one over lambda, or e to the minus one over lambda square? Can they invalidate the answer? I'll tell you the answer. No, this does not happen, but I want you to understand why. So recall the three problems. The easiest, the increasing degree of difficulty. The simplest one, consider the same Lagrangian, the same renormalizable Lagrangian with several fields. Number two, 
take arbitrary k and arbitrary w. w can have phi to the 10th or phi to the 100, and k could have logarithms or something. Doesn't matter. And number three, explain why non-perturbative effects do not renormalize this superpotential. So let's accept that as true. I'll just tell you right away that the fact that in this theory, non-perturbative effects do not modify the superpotential, this statement is not true once gauge fields are present. Once the theory includes gauge fields, non-perturbative effects are very interesting, and they can modify the superpotential. Even though it's outside the main course of my talk, I would like to relate what I told you so far to Witten's talk yesterday, or more precisely to the analytic continuation of Witten's talk from yesterday. He talked about n equals two. In n equals two, the superpotential is kind of trivial. In a sense, there isn't really an independent superpotential. All the fun comes from an object he introduced known as the prepotential. The prepotential is fun because it is integrated over half of superspace. So Bagger today described this n equals two superspace, and he wrote the Lagrangian as an integral with four d's, but without d bars. Thank God Matt was in the audience. No d bar. This object is supersymmetric because it's integrated only over half of superspace. The other half of superspace is in invariance under the other half of the supersymmetry algebra is automatic. So in n equals one, the power we have is over the superpotential. In n equals two, the same logic tells us that the power is over the prepotential. So the object of interest is always an object which is holomorphic. It should be interesting, there's freedom of writing different terms, but we cannot write the most general thing because we are constrained by holomorphy. So when we go to n equals two, the same thing is true. Many of the things you learn about the superpotential in n equals one are true about the prepotential in n equals two. The prepotential, for various technical reasons, has a one loop correction, a logarithm that Witten described yesterday. So there is a tree term, which is phi square. There is a log correction, which is phi square log. That happens at one loop. And then all the higher order corrections in perturbation theory are zero. Very similar to what we saw here, with essentially the same proof. With essentially the same proof. The goal there is to see if there are any non-perturbative corrections, and there are non-perturbative corrections. So the fun in gauge dynamics is first because the superpotential here, or the prepotential there, does not receive many perturbative corrections, but what's more interesting is that it does receive non-perturbative corrections. Not in this theory, but in the gauge theory. So all the fun comes from that. So this is a general comment I wanted to make. And before I move to the next topic, I'd like to ask if there are any questions. Am I going too slowly or too fast? Oh, so yeah. nothing happens to w come up to k? Oh, k is a mess. Oh. k is really a mess. And we'll soon see examples of corrections to k. Quantum field, these supersymmetric quantum field theories are simpler than ordinary field theories, but they're not completely trivial. For example, phi can have anomalous dimensions. So this, are, this is a full-fledged quantum field theory. Phi can have anomalous dimension, and the anomalous dimension of phi comes from renormalization of k. In ordinary field theories, anomalous, anomalous dimensions in perturbation theory are associated with renormalization of the kinetic term, not of the potential. So the analogous statement in ordinary field theories is that the potential, imagine the potential is not renormalized, but the kinetic term is renormalized. Now, some people like to perform wave function renormalization and move all these z's, these ugly z's, move them from the kinetic term to the potential. And in ordinary field theory, this might or might not be a useful thing to do. In supersymmetric theories, this is a terrible thing to do. It leads to a lot of confusions. So if you want a general rule, don't do that. There's renormalization of the Kähler potential. Keep it there. It's very happy there. Don't move it around. 
keep the superpotential unrenormalized. Because it's not renormalized. So if you have something which is beautiful, don't, don't mess with it. Any more questions? I asked about the speed. Should I speed up or? So most of you don't even know whether I should speed up or not. <laughs> Sorry? Which means I should go slower. Okay. The next topic I want to discuss, so this was kind of an introduction to quantum field theory, to supersymmetric field theories, and we saw that things are simpler in the quantum regime. Some things are not corrected. The next topic I'd like to discuss, mostly in preparation for Nima's talks this afternoon. In fact, I think Nima will also use some of that. Maybe not today, but tomorrow. Yeah. So the next thing that Nima needs is the fact that supersymmetry can be spontaneously broken. So till the end of, probably till the end of the next talk, or toward the end of next talk, I'll talk about supersymmetry breaking. This is very important phenomenologically because for the real world, we need to break supersymmetry because if we look around us, we don't see any sign of supersymmetry. So we would like to find, can supersymmetry be spontaneously broken? Now, the fact that I would like to emphasize that throughout these talks, I will talk about spontaneous supersymmetry breaking as opposed to explicit breaking. I tentatively had explicit breaking when I promoted these, chiral super, these parameters to chiral superfields. So if I have background M, which depends on X and on theta, I tentatively break supersymmetry through the theta dependence in the mass. But in these talks, I'm not interested in that. So I'm doing this only as a device to control the dependence on lambda. Now we'd like to see whether supersymmetry can be spontaneously broken. So what's the difference between explicit breaking and spontaneous breaking? Explicit breaking means that we have a theory which has an approximate symmetry, but the symmetry is not exact. Going back to the hydrogen atom with the electric field, the SO3 symmetry of rotation is not an exact symmetry of the problem. It's broken by the electric field. It's broken to U1 when we rotate around the direction of the electric field. This is known as explicit breaking. We still get a lot of selection rules, as I emphasized earlier, even when symmetries are explicitly broken. The problem we are interested in here is different. Here we are interested in spontaneous breaking. What does that mean? The theory is perfectly supersymmetric. All the warded entities are satisfied, but the ground state does not respect the symmetries. Example, take a magnet. Don't put any magnetic field. We have all sorts of spins inside. The spins are free to move around. The ground state could be such that all the spins point in a given direction. When all the spins point in a given direction, the magnet becomes a magnet. It's ferromagnetic, so it's, it's a magnet. Which direction do the spins point? We can't predict that. There is one good ground state when all the spins point in one direction, and there is another perfectly equal ground state where all the spins point in another direction. They are equal in the sense that we can take the magnet and rotate it and get the other one. But these are really two different states. More technically, we say that at finite volume or in quantum mechanics, we should average over all these states and have momentum eigenstates which relate them. At infinite volume, we don't do that. The Hilbert space breaks into separate Hilbert spaces, one for each ground state, and the overlap between any state in one and any state in the other is zero. In fact, it's e to the minus the volume of the system. I assume that you learned all that in your quantum field theory course. So this is spontaneous breaking. So now we would like to do the same thing in supersymmetry. And the situation is dramatically different. For ordinary symmetries, spontaneous symmetry breaking occurs only when the system has infinite volume. Equivalently, it does not occur in quantum mechanics. Supersymmetry breaking can occur in quantum mechanics. We don't need this infinite volume. So we're now talking about SUSY breaking. And recall, this is spontaneous SUSY breaking. 
And we need an order parameter for SUSY breaking. For ordinary spins, for a rotation symmetry like for spin, the order parameter for the symmetry breaking is the magnetization. We compute the magnetization. If it's non-zero, and with all the spins point in a given direction, we say that the symmetry is spontaneously broken. It doesn't matter where they point as long as it's non-zero. What's the order parameter for SUSY breaking? That is the vacuum energy. So if the ground state energy is zero, then supersymmetry is unbroken. But it also goes the other way, which means that if the ground state energy is non-zero, supersymmetry is broken. And the easiest way to see that is to just look at the supersymmetry algebra. So the supersymmetry algebra, and I suppress i's and minus signs and indices and so forth, has this form. One component of this is the energy, which appears here. It's the zeroth component of that. So let me be more, I think there's a sigma mu here and alpha alpha dot, and there might be an i somewhere. That's not important for us. So one component, imagine only the energy is not zero, the momentum is zero. Then we see that Q with Q is the energy. And then the condition for supersymmetry to be unbroken is that both Q and Q dagger annihilate the vacuum. And that's if and only if the ground state energy is non-zero. So now let's do it in field theory in our toy model over there. So we have some Kähler potential and super potential. So if we have a theory with K, and w, then the potential is obtained from taking the derivative of w, big I, the derivative with respect to I bar of its complex conjugate, and multiplying by a metric g i i bar, which comes from the Kähler potential, where this object g i i bar is d i k, sorry, d i d bar i bar k, this is G i i bar. This is the metric. So this is the potential. And this is a sum of positive definite quantities, positive semi-definite quantities. So if we want the vacuum energy to be 0, we learn that the vacuum energy was 0 if and only if d i w equals 0. So the supersymmetric ground states are the stationary points of the superpotential. The superpotential can be a horribly complicated function. Recall, we are not limited by renormalizability. And if it has a stationary point, if W has a stationary point, then supersymmetry is unbroken, and the system is just there. At that point, the potential vanishes because this is 0. In fact, this is also 0. If, on the other hand, we cannot find the stationary point for the superpotential, if there is no stationary point, then the ground state energy is non-zero and supersymmetry is broken. So let's work out some examples and then formulate some general results. And I really like to study three different examples with increasing degree of difficulty, but these examples are very illuminating because almost all known examples of supersymmetry breaking are much more elaborate and much more sophisticated. A lot of their properties can be traced back to these three trivial examples. So the first will be completely trivial, the second will be almost completely trivial, and the third will be slightly more elaborate but still rather easy. So before I do that, are there any questions? So I like to start with example number one. This would be the simplest model. We take one chiral superfield, call it X, and we'll let the superpotential be linear in X, and the Kähler potential is X absolute value square. What's the potential? 
we use the formula from here to learn that the potential V is F square. In fact, we can rotate the phase of F away. So the ground state energy is non-zero. And since the ground state energy is non-zero, supersymmetry is spontaneously broken. This model is very trivial. This is a free field theory. Since it's a free field theory, we know how to compute everything. The only thing which is slightly non-trivial here is that the ground state energy is non-zero. So what's the spectrum? The spectrum includes a charge boson, the scalar component of X. This is a charge boson. The problem has a U1R symmetry under which X carries charge 2. So our charge boson has charge 2. There is also a massless fermion. This theory looks completely, the spectrum looks supersymmetric, but it's important that the massless fermion is there. It can be either thought of as the supersymmetric partner of the charge boson, or it can be thought of as the Goldstino, the massless fermion associated with the spontaneous breaking of supersymmetry. So whenever supersymmetry is spontaneously broken, there must be a massless fermion, a massless Goldstino. Analogous to the massless pion when chiral symmetry is broken, or the massless Goldstone boson when uh, any global symmetry is broken. I'll leave it as a homework for you. What's the massless boson when the spins all point in one direction? There must be a massless boson in the spectrum, the Goldstone boson. What is it? What is it called? But that's an exercise. So the spectrum includes massless scalar field X and a fermion psi, which we now interpret to be the Goldstino. There's another thing we can learn from this problem. If we look at the potential, it's independent of x. So we can turn on an expectation value for x. So this theory has many different ground states labeled by the expectation value of x. In this case, the physics is completely equivalent in all of them. We can shift x by a constant, we get the same physics. In more complicated examples, this will no longer be the case. And physics will depend on x. You will see, and that's very common in supersymmetric theory, that the theory has a moduli space of vacua. The vacuum is not unique. There are many different vacua. We saw that yesterday in Wittenstock, the n equals 2 theory has a moduli space of vacua. These are inequivalent vacua. So the n equals 2 theory has an inequivalent set of vacua. The same is true here, except that here the vacua are equivalent. Now, this example is very misleading. It's misleading because it's free. In more interesting theories, the moduli space of vacua that this brings us will not be, the theory will not be free. As we move from one ground state to another, the physics is different. And then radiative corrections might or might not lift this degeneracy. In the examples in n equals 2 that Witten described yesterday, the Quantum corrections do not lift the degeneracy. That's something to prove. One has to prove that this vacuum degeneracy is not lifted. And the full quantum theory has still this moduli space of vacua. That's not always true. In this case, supersymmetry is broken. So a lot of the magic of supersymmetry is gone. And therefore, we are more likely to be able to lift the degeneracy. In this particular example, which is free, we don't do that. We don't do that because the theory is free. There is nothing to compute. But in slightly more complicated examples, we shall soon show there is such a degeneracy at leading order, but quantum corrections lift the degeneracy. Therefore, we call this moduli space of vacua not a moduli space of vacua, but a pseudo-moduli space of vacua. OK, so this is what I wanted to say about example number one, which is misleadingly simple. Let's go to example number two. Oops. Example number two will be slightly more interesting. We'll take the same superpotential we had before, W equals x, fx, 
but we'll include a more complicated Kähler potential. For example, we can expand it like that. So the superpotential is still simple. It does not have any stationary points. Superpotential does not have any stationary points. Therefore, supersymmetry is broken. But now the vacuum degeneracy is lifted. Because if we use the formula from here above, we see that the potential is f squared. I took f to be real. 1 plus 4 little x squared over m squared plus dot, dot, dot. So now the potential depends on x. Since the potential depends on x, it's no longer flat, but it has a little bit of curvature. Now, this model is not renormalizable. We can compute loops with it if we want. It doesn't matter for us at the moment. And it can arise from a more microscopic model, which is renormalizable, or from a more microscopic model, which itself is not renormalizable. What this term is telling us here is there must be new physics at the scale m. There must be new physics at the scale m. But what it is doesn't matter for us, because that's the beauty of writing an effective Lagrangian. We don't care what happens at short distance. All we need is this term. A lot of information is irrelevant for us, hence the term irrelevant operators. And all we need is that this term is there. And this term gives the boson from the previous example a mass m. So in this example two, we have a massless psi and a massive X is still a complex boson. It's a complex boson which is charged under the R symmetry. This problem has an R symmetry. The boson is charged under it, carries some charge. And we have a massless fermion, which is the Goldstino. So this is still the Goldstino. So unlike the previous example, we see that the moduli space of vacua is gone. Now the theory is massive. The spectrum is no longer supersymmetric. So this is a much more realistic model. And in fact, you can take this model, forget where it came from, and use it to do model building. Take this Lagrangian, couple it to other fields, and do model building for particle physics. I'd like to do one more thing with this model before we leave. This k was obtained by integrating out heavy modes at the scale m. So we integrate them out. Now we find some massive particle whose mass comes from here is f over m. So this has mass for the f over m. It might be a 4. Now we would like to integrate out this scalar field and find a low energy effective Lagrangian. So let me do that. So it's again in the same spirit of the Wilsonian Lagrangian. We integrate out massive modes. So we had in integral d4 theta, this includes many terms. Among them is minus 1 over m squared f of x dagger x dagger minus psi psi plus f of x x plus complex conjugate plus dot dot dot. So this is an expansion of the Lagrangian in small fields. Now we can integrate out x, but not psi of x. And we'll learn that x is psi psi over f of x. f of x is the auxiliary field of f. We can take that and substitute it in the Lagrangian. And for various biological problems, I'll have to stop now, and I'll continue tomorrow. I stopped before time. I need